Hello, everyone. My name is Leanne Kim, and on behalf of the Women's Museum of California, I would like to welcome you to this conversation about the powerful film, Mu and the Vanishing World. This documentary is part of the museum's June film series that includes two additional films also directed by phenomenal women. Before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge our community sponsors for this film, Walsh Family Charities, the, the Filipino American Communications Employees of AT&T, the Women's Studies Department of San Diego State University, and the Asian Pacific Alliance of County Employees. And a shout out to our community partners, the San Diego Chinese Women's Association, Union of Pan-Asian Communities, and UC San Diego alumni, go Tritons. Thank you all so much for supporting this timely and meaningful film which comes during a time of rising anti-Asian hate. Mu and the Vanishing World is an intimate look at a courageous, determined woman and her journey from Southeast Asia, and she helps us to reimagine the refugee experience in America. I am joined now by co-director and producer of the film, Jessica Leung, who, by the way, is a graduate of UCSD. And I'm especially excited to meet and speak with the main character of the movie, Mu Prey, who is joining us from her home and farm in Davis City, Iowa. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us. It's good to see you. It's a pleasure. Good to see you too. Thank you for having us. Oh, it's, I'm so excited for this conversation and especially talking to you, Mu, because I understand this is the first time that you're participating in a Q&A about the documentary, so I'm so honored. You know, this movie captured some of the most important years of your life, and I'm curious, what did you think about the film? I, well, first of all, I want to, um, to, to say that I'm very honest to be here, and I want to say thank you to Jessica Paco. Without them, I won't be here today. and. Without them, uh, the movie won't be finished and my story won't be here. And yes, they do a very great job and I love the movie. And even myself, you know, I know myself, but it's a lot of my story and I love to watch it. I watch it like three times. <laughs> <laughs> So you know um, what was included, what was not included in the film. Is there any particular moment in the film that really, uh, that you thought, ooh, this was an important part of the movie? It's a lot, but you know, um, as like, I'm, uh, I'm 32 now, you know, I have uh, so many things that, um, I want to put in and I forgot to mention all those kind of things. Yeah. It's several, several things. Well, there are so many things that we did experience with you and we just want to thank you for allowing Paco and Jessica into your life and just being so trusting with them. So Jessica, I want to ask you, like, this was an incredible journey following Mu from the time she was 19. She's now 32. Um, you know, from the time she was a teenager living with her long neck tribe um, in Thailand, becoming a single mother, resettling in the heartland of America. Mm. I want to ask you first, how much did you know about the Kayan people before you made this film? And two, how in the world did you connect, get connected with someone as charismatic and wonderful as Moo? Yeah, this is actually interesting because I knew absolutely nothing. <laughs> um, so Papa and I had been just coming off of another project we did in India, and we were actually like decompressing. We were taking some time out for us, uh, traveling in northern Thailand. Paco had heard about them before, so we did take the trek up there. You know, um, when we arrived, it was quite you know for me just from the moment we we found her Kayan village, Kayan Paya. And walking around, I, you know, I just, everything was so, I thought, wow, this part of the world, this little pocket, I have no idea. And then, then we, I mean, I heard Mu speaking a little English, which was what attracted us. You know, I had tried to speak with a couple of people, a little difficult. And when I came around the corner and heard her, I just kind of gravitated towards her. And she saw Paco and she started speaking Spanish. So, wow. <laughs> and, uh, hola, guapo. And uh, immediately we're just, you know, 
started to have this uh, great little uh, conversation with Mo, and she invited us into her home, her family home for lunch. And we ended up staying for a week. <laughs> and from there, it's because there was a wedding of her neighbor that was going to happen soon. And then all the students from the refugee camp were coming down and they were telling us all the backstory about what happened to their people, how, how they end up there, um, how why the families fled. And really they had been there almost, some of them almost two decades. So it was kind of a stagnant limbo state and when they mentioned that the UN was going to start going to start a resettlement program, all this just, you can imagine, it just every little pass, every conversation, every moment just expanded my mind about, wow, what is going on here? And it really actually touched a chord with me at being a, a daughter of immigrants um, from China that, wow, you know, of course, we all know that America is made up of immigrants and we all have these stories about how you come to America. There's a certain level of assimilation, adaptation, but I just thought, wow, um, for Mu, for the Kayan women, for the Kayan people, there's something about, you know, your culture having to be assimilated that is going to be even more raw as it's a physical, you know, very physical experience. And so I just, was drawn to the whole thought of, wow, what is new America, you know, our new Americans going to experience? And so we, you know, discussed with Mu and her, her community over some time about, about sharing the story. When we came across this story and started to realize, realize how enormous this story was, but you could not find anything on internet for you know, standard investigation when you're living uh, in Europe. Uh, so we made a plan and chose to move uh, to the town right next to Mu. So we moved so, into a, a small... So, sorry. so you, you, you specifically moved to um, the, the next town with the intention of profiling Mu and her people? Well, originally, yes, we were originally we were actually moving there to do investigation to understand, um, get a footing on what was really happening. We were actually initially following four different stories and from the rebels to the medics that would go back into the jungles to help the people that were displaced. And Mu was definitely one of our strong you know, characters. And in the end, she was the one that I, we just realized that it's almost and this information. It was also so enormous to put in a documentary. Um, at that time, it was a you know six part series. It was just one feature documentary. We decided, you know what, with Mu, we're going to reach people's hearts because she is her her character, her her strength, her openness. Um, you know, really, we just knew that with her sharing her story, we would reach people in a way that could actually probably bring information that's very dense, but in a way that is very personal, very, you know, one-to-one um, -one contact almost. So so we were thankful that Mu agreed and we, uh, we went on that journey with her. Well, I'm so grateful for you and Paco for um, taking that, making that commitment to being in the community in which, um, you know, where you were investigating that, that must have been um, a lot of work on your end. But for Mu, this is a great opportunity for you to um, share with the world um, a look into the Cayenne culture. You know, for me, you are the first Cayenne person I've ever met. And um, here in San Diego, there is a growing Karen refugee community. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you're having to explain to a lot of people what does Cayenne, Kareni, what does this all mean? How would you describe and explain to people who don't understand your culture, what does it mean to be Kayan or Kareni? Well, um, Kayan and Kareni, they all come from the Myanmar, but they are not Burmese people. That's the first thing I want people to know. And, and then we are from the Kareni, uh, Kareni state. In the Kareni state, we have a separate, uh, how do you call that, dialects and the different people. And let's say Karini, we also have a Kayan, 
Kayam and Karen, Kayo, Mono, uh, all those kind of, uh, a lot of people out there. We are different people. We are uh, different culture. Uh, we are different language. Which probably creates a lot of challenges for people on the outside to come in and <laughs> to tell your story it. because there's so many dialects, right? Because there might be um, a Kareni who might not be able to speak to a Kayan because the dialects are so different. Is that correct? That's correct. But usually it's Kayan people that will speak different language. I see. Yeah. And the reason we do that, we like to spread, uh, go to different uh, country. We like to go to a different state. And we just like to learn, I guess. Mostly, even older people, they will speak more than one language. Well, you have all proven from the very beginning how clever you are <laughs> and how intelligent you are, picking up English from the tourists, even Spanish for the tourists, uh, uh, which is why Paco, you know, kind of honed in on you. So um, I love to see that kind of determination and intelligence um, from, you know, from you, Mu, from the very beginning. Um, Jessica and Mu, this question is for you. Um, there must have been challenges, right? So, you know, Mu, you've um, evolved in terms of your English ability. And Jessica, I'm assuming that you don't speak any kind of Cayenne, uh, you know, right? So I'm just, how, did you, how did you overcome this language barrier as you're filming like hundreds of hours of, of, of film with people, like you don't understand what's going on? Yeah. So in the beginning with the investigation of doing two hour interviews with, you know, rebel leaders and actually some of them spoke English, but we also were, we were very cognizant of the value of language and the expression. So we wanted them to speak in their own language. Mm -hmm. And so we would run the interviews actually in their language. You know, we would have sometimes speak uh, if they could uh, ask the question in English or we'd have a translator and they would just answer in their language. And then later I would go back and sit with somebody that's helping us do the translations and we would have some hours of tran translations going on. So um, specifically with Mu, I mean, we did absolutely connect on many levels from the beginning. And so the language was almost secondary. We could find the way, you know, find the way to communicate. And a lot of it was just, um, I think she had already many years of finding the way with people that even Japanese people that don't speak any English or anything, <laughs> just, you know, finding the way to, you know, sit with somebody. And we like, we spent we sat many hours <laughs> with her. And then also just understanding when we realized, okay, we're going to focus this on Mu and part of our, the story here is of course the culture. The culture is going to be dispersed. This diaspora that's going to happen is going to split them up. How is this going to happen when they're in America, Finland, you know, New Zealand? How will people carry that on? And But what we want to value here is where they are now. So we did kind of line ourselves up with a little bit, of, oh, you go foraging, let's go foraging in the forest. Oh, you you know, go down to the river. Um, just a lot of things that they did on a daily basis and they were so open, so welcoming to how to share that with us. Um, and, you know, we were in their ear a little bit like, oh, and if you do any kind of uh, ritual or celebrate, oh, you know what, let's do this, you know, and so they would call us even. Uh, and we may be on the other side at an education conference, but, you know, we got called back. Okay, we're building our house. Okay, we're coming back. And so we really were very fortunate to have that line of um, understanding with Moo and her family and her, her, her village to be able to capture these moments over time. And then these all served as really incredible ways to bring in the first half of the film a, a, a very intimate glimpse into a culture that mo most people may not know about. And if you do and come across them, maybe it was only for an afternoon. So we really wanted to also, yeah, preserve um, her culture and honor it in this way. So it was really a, obviously a group community tribal <laughs> effort. Yeah, and we really did get an intimate look at various things such as looking at the rooster bones after your son was born, 
um, how you collected the silver coins to pay off your dowry. I mean, there were, and you know, even when you returned to the village later, how your mother said, "Oh, you are a good daughter because you came back and killed a pig." <laughs> right? Was, and and there are so many things that just really stood out to me. Um, Moo, now that you've been in the United States for a while, and you, you said this in your in the film, the longer you're away from home, the more you forget. And I'm wondering, yes. you know, what traditions are you holding on to on on your little farm in Iowa? Like, how how are you upholding your Cayenne culture there? Well, I'm. Um, yeah, you're right. The more I far away from my country, my culture, the more I, I I'm get a little bit uh, for. Uh, forget. But however, I am pretty uh, still strong. I collect um, a lot of stuff. Like uh, just uh, recently, just two weeks ago, I collect one of the, um, the very old 200 year old coin from Myanmar. And I, and I also got, still have a lot of clothes. And also I still have a guitar from from my country and I still play and sing it even I'm not the great singer you know singing you know but I still sing around I still some even I'm the only one in the farm uh, in the farms I'm still dancing by myself <laughs> you know, of course people th uh, my kids and my husband um, you know they're thinking I'm crazy but yeah that is me and yes, I still keep in a lot of stuff from my culture. How, how is your family? I'm wondering if you still um, connect with them. Is your mother still alive? How, how's your relationship with your family? Me and my older sister, Mudan, we um, still talk almost every week. My mom, she's, we talk maybe once a month or twice a month because the place she in right now is not much internet and i can't call her when i want to only when she want to call me she will go to the very high mount and call me and yeah she can do that often you know um mu and jessica what really pained me uh was watching your relationship with your mom which is so different than your relationship with your own children, Mu. Um, I want to ask you, uh, you know, looking at your mom's relationship on the film, you and your mom's relationship, how you said she'll never forgive you for the pain that you caused her while coming out, which has, you know, obviously it's not your, that wasn't your fault, <laughs> right? And also I, I heard a little bit of guilt when you said, you know, um, when you die, I'll, I'm probably gonna go to hell. I'll see you there if you end up there. I think you're a great person, <laughs> right? So I don't know if there's guilt um, around uh, maybe that, that was caused from your mom's relationship. Can you talk a little bit more about that? And also the dichot how different your relationship is with your own children as, as a mom? Well, um, my mom, she's, she's a nice, uh, she's, she's great. She's great. And she's, she's a hard working, uh, work, walk. Um, in, but the hard, hard thing is for her, she's, uh, into two husbands, two marry, and with two separate kids with two different father. Mm -hmm. And also, I have to say is the biggest problem is me too because I do blame on myself myself most of the time because I just want to be independent. Mm -hmm. I don't want to listen to to anybody, and I want to do it. And but for her, she want me to be a good daughter. She want me to be a good woman. But according to me, no, I want to get out of here. I want to be standing my own foot and I want to have my own voice with my own freedom. And that's why we kind, you know, it's kind of not a great thing 
but re- for her, she thinks she do the right thing. But for me, I think I do the right thing as well. <laughs> right. You had different outlooks because she she um, thought of she wanted to stay where she was. She's very comfortable, whereas you are very adventurous and really wanted to see the world. You said early on that you wanted your child to be educated and to know about computers, yeah. which is Mm-hmm. you know, yeah. uh, really not accessible um, where you were. So you had a lot of goals and dreams. Jessica, how did you decide on how, you know, there's there's purpose in various scenes that you chose to edit into this film. Can you talk about, you know, how you crafted um, together the relationship with um, Moo and her mom versus Moo and her own child? Sure, yeah. I did want to say that, I mean, with Mu and her mother's relationship overall, I mean, we we definitely commend her on, I mean, being that rebellious, independent woman uh, mm-hmm. in, within a society that doesn't value women so much, even though, you know, they are the strength and the and the face of their tribe. They're, they're, you could see it, you could hear it in the conversations when she was paying her dowry, that there is not, there was not, value before for a daughter, right? So I think also for Mulu's experience growing up in um, for you, a few years in the uh, Kayan village in Thailand, they were a, you know, a taboo family because it was a mother, a single mother and two girls for a while. And they experienced a lot of um, intense, you know, judgment that I, I imagine for Mu, you know, as a, a child, you maybe don't know anything other until then she had um, her stepfather come in who was very loving and created the, a family unit that was also something that taught her, I think, um, that a family can, a parent can be caring, loving. And her mother, I think we accept that she just did the best she could for what she knew. She had so much backstory going on <laughs> and history and that was hurtful and she didn't know how else to manage on her own. And it's great that she came around um, full circle with Moo. But I also think it's very commendable that Moo broke the cycle of, you know, being such, she be, became such a loving mother uh, and she's best friends with her oldest, John. I mean, she's just like, they're always, you know, I mean, now he's taller than her. So they were, you know, side by side. And uh, that's unbelievable. And, uh, he is my yeah. older brother now. Uh, <laughs> well, you made so, a promise together. You mean, Moo, you made a promise to your son while he was in your womb that yep. if you gave him life, you would be together and make a meaningful life like that. I love how you chose that, Jessica, in the beginning as like a way to open the story because it's even beyond the story, that's Moo's le- one of Moo's biggest legacies, right? Is her relationship with her child. Exactly. And the fact that she shared that story with us. And then when you're crafting the story, you're also not sure how much of what's shared in a personal conversation we can bring to the film, because some of this is very raw, you know? And the fact that she was open to, to I mean, she was always pretty much open to try yeah. whatever um, things we were suggesting. Uh, that was Paco's idea about the, the jungle. Let's let's recreate this jungle walk. And so we go to the jungle with her. It was really, um, you know, the gravity came out in the edit, of course. Um, and regarding, you know, depicting her her relationship with her mother, it, it was one of our obstacles because her mother was quite, you know, you could see her her face, her character, but of course we don't speak directly with her so much. We have a lot of interaction that's pretty open and loving. And we're, I mean, we're sharing food, but of course when she's speaking to move specifically, we don't know what she's saying. Uh, I can read faces a little bit, you know. So we know that there was a lot of tension. Sometimes we'd ask, you know, we would ask Moo like what's going on. And of course, if Moo shared, you know, what she, she felt like she could share with us. It weaved in our brains, like, okay, how do we, how do we show this without actually? I mean, we're not going to have a full, you know, conversation between them that we're going to be able to 
to to capture. We got lucky, very honestly. The the return to Thailand, filming their talk on the balcony. Um, yeah, it was. You know, we don't know what they're speaking about, and it's a it's it's actual it's an actual conversation they're having after Moo's been away for a few years, and and so what came out was you know, very honest between them and the fact that we could translate it and they were willing for it to be in the film. That's, I think that's just, I don't know, very fortunate on all our parts. And the fact that Mo and her family, you know, were open to, to share that. So yeah, I think creating the story and the tension between them uh, was really about finding these moments. And a lot of it, you can see, we see her mother um, not actually speaking, maybe, well, the one time she spoke to us while on camera when she's weaving, that was just me also saying, we need to go talk to her. And this is what she spoke about. So it was a very, it was like we were speaking to everybody, everybody, a lot of the women about how do you feel about this possibility of, you know, your village, your community going, going off to other countries. So she was very honest. It was something very personal. And so we just really, um, we really uh, found the moments, and then in the edit, as we say, you know, it had to come together in a way with the rhythm to create their attention and their outcome. So that played out in a way that, you know, you can never know in documentary film, you never know really where it's going to go. Um, in fact, when we were, when she came back to Thailand, we happened to be in Thailand because we were living there during that time. And she called us up and said, "Hey, I'm coming back. I'm bringing my. I want my son to see his, the village, you know, meet the family. And um, can you help me? Because I don't know how to travel in Thailand. I I lived all my life in this one area, and of course, with the UN, she was brought to Bangkok and flew out. So, so we, you know, we're luckily in Bangkok, and we, you know, managed all the transportation, the places where she should go and stay, and how to get there, and then." I, you know, very honestly, I didn't know. I mean, just ask her confirmation. Is it okay if we come with you? <laughs> and she said, please. <laughs> so we traveled together on the train and then we, you know, we rented a car and went through. And, uh, and in a way it was, it was just amazing synchronicity, a blessing that we were actually there because we're not actually, you know, filmmakers that can say, oh yeah, we'll just fly to Thailand and meet you there. We were there. So then, fortunately, the we stars were, aligned for you. It was, yeah, it all came together the over, the years, over the years, yes. <laughs> so, Mu, it was very interesting to see your, your coming back to visit your mother. This after you lived in the United States for a few years, your son is a little bit Americanized. You know, you dress differently. You look different. You got sunglasses on your head. <laughs> and you look like a tourist in your own village, you know, and... You got to be a tourist in Thailand. We saw you watching um, a hill. Uh, it was like what? It was like a hill village little tourist yeah. spot. And how you said you felt so sad. Can you express to us again? Um, you know what that experience was like going back and feeling like a tourist in your, you know, among your own people. Well, um, first thing I, I came, I came back like a tourist. But um, but I am not tourist, and I I now I'm at two spots. That one I was in in the valley. How do I feel when on that time? But now I'm back in Thailand like a tourist, and I feel what the tourists think about, and. But the tourist, is, I'm sure, uh, just gonna be like me if um, I never know before, I never know these people and what the culture, what they look like, how they eat, how they drink, how they think, how they, you know, those kind of questions. After I live, I, uh, I also have that question as well because, oh, okay, 10 years ago, I used to live here and you know, um, that time I used to do this to do that. I was wondering what they do now. What's the change? What's everything go? You know, but the the thing is, I I was sad is I love my culture. It's beautiful. It's amazing, and I just wish that 
this woman they have a like a freedom and they can dress up and they don't have to have a like tourist coming like an animal like a zoom and like when they go to the street or they go to city and the people want to feel like different you know i just even now and let me take back a little bit uh, even now when i dress up like my culture people will look at me like we we heard about that we see on the tv we we see on the post post uh or we see on the picture of you know those kind of things and they were asking take a picture i'm happy on that because i stand it from my culture with freedoms and i just wish they are freedom with the culture and they can go anywhere and, and don't and not keep it on the same plane in in front of tourists mm -hmm. freedom we we hear that um we hear and we feel that that um sentiment all throughout the movie and and particularly jessica i remember the shot of the elephant chained down to the ground and that was really so sad, right? Um, we think about the animals, but then we also think about the people who are like caged in their village, right? Um, and how Mu, you also kind of bought your freedom by paying the dowry to your mother. There's so many times where this topic comes up. Um, so um, Jessica, was that, um, intentional, you know, the idea of showcasing the free, the, you know, freedom versus being stuck, you know? Yeah, it, it's like you said, it's a theme throughout the film and we draw it from definitely where it is kind of their caged people living in this situation. And yes, with the, also the animals, which was all at the new place where they are now in, in Thailand is all together as, you know, elephant rides and you know, see the people, it's, it's horrible. So what we were looking at was that not only in Thailand and how the idea was that they would be uh, resettled to another country, a third country, and then supposedly set free. But we also had in mind about, wow, okay, so what is ex refugee experience like? Um, when you actually arrived in, in this case, America, is it a is it a complete you know free experience? And then, as we come to see, specifically, it's um, there's a whole infrastructure about what is happening. And you know, we'll probably understand that. Yes, we um, in one way we all feel like there is help being done um, to get them out of their situation. But there's also, I mean, Mu is very fortunate because that she's able to be above this you know, situation. She can speak English, she can choose. A lot of people can't choose. They are working night shifts um, and they're really, we saw what happened during the pandemic. They're, you know, they are not able to choose. And so we are looking at that side of freedom as well, right? Yeah, we, um, you know, uh, wow. There's so much that you, you put in there in her resettlement in the United States and Mu, you talking about learning that, oh, you know, America is very open, but they're bringing us over here specifically to take jobs in factories that nobody else wants to take, probably at low rate wages and just mindless work that, you know, has impact on your body, you know, doing that kind of work over and over again. Um, ha have, has your thoughts and feelings changed about um, being a refugee since you've been here? I quite don't understand your question. Oh, I, I just wanted to, so when you first came here, you understood um, that there was a role for refugees, right? That mm -hmm. one, one reason why United States brought you here was to resettle you and to take you out of a bad situation. But as yep. Jessica and the film showed, there's a whole business side <laughs> to bringing refugees here. Yep. 
Right. And you saw that because, and you talked yeah. about it because of all the factory workers, right? Yep. How has your own mind and image of being a refugee and being American, how has that changed in the years you've been here? Well, uh, like when the time that Jessica Paco was um, interviewed me, and uh, yes, I do see that uh, it's more like business. But the, um, yes, uh, a lot of job in the United States here is uh, that American people don't want to do, or it's a heavy job, is, um, is, is like eight to 10 hours a day in, in the production and standings and with cutting the meat and then use your knife and with an eye, all those things, it's a hard job. And I see that the, the benefit from the American to bring refugee is to have um, refugee to work in at the um, productions and that's how they make money. But however, now that I find out that, yes, they brought us here to work in, in the um, productions. But if you still strong and you want to change, you don't want to work in, in the production, you have a choice. You can go back to school. But for me, on that time, I don't have a choice. I can't go to school because I, I'm single mom. I have to work, make money. But I still fight. And I, I work and I took English class. And on top of that, I go to people house and make a friend with Americans <laughs> and try to learn more. Either I don't know if they like me or not. I just go over there and try to make friends and talk to American people. And then they can talk to me English and I learn it. And that's why I put myself in my mind and said, no, I'm going to continue to do it. And I'm not going to do the hard work. I want to my life better and stand it for my kids. And I, from, from the future for me and my, my kids. We also have a choice to go, but some people, they, they don't. Well, it seems to me that you are a very resourceful person, you know, and I loved watching how you created those choices for you. You know, one, one very remarkable scene to me is when you're explaining to that woman sitting on the bench about how you got food stamps. You didn't know what you were doing. <laughs> should I take the red ticket in line or should I take the blue ticket in line? Yeah. I don't know. I'm just going to take both tickets. <laughs> And that, and I think that's what makes Moo so special, right, Jessica? Is that she uh, is kind of fearless, right, and just figures it out, which is, you know, quite frankly, not everyone can do that, right? Well, in my life, uh, I know I, a lot of things I do mistake, but I'm not afraid to be mistake, and I'm not afraid to try it, and if I got yelling because I do mistake and I will learn it. And that's why I can do it every day. Well, and that's why this film is so wonderful because we can learn even so much from you and your attitude towards life. You know, there are so many people who are afraid of making mistakes and that's what holds them back, right? Is, is, yeah. is the fear, you know? Um, Jessica, it took a lot for you to put this movie together. We're talking 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you were uh, the producer and the co-director and you're dealing with time, you're dealing with hundreds of hours of footage, you're dealing with multiple languages and then the financials, right? Mm -hmm. um, tell me about the story of Anjali Jolie as uh -huh. part of the process, because uh, I think this is a really funny uh, backstory. Yeah, so that's true. So the thing is um, when Paco and I, so we did meet Moo in 2008, 
And then we went back in 2009 to live in the, the village next to her. So we were there for um, six months renting uh, you know, a house that had electricity so we could charge. Um, and we were coming at the end of our time there and we heard since she was a Goodwill you know, ambassador, she had, she was actually visiting one of the villages, um, of not the Kayantaya village that we were in there, but she did visit the Kayan, one of the three Kayan villages. We had just missed her actually, I think. Um, but so very funny because Paco does this. He's like, oh, we need to talk to her. Do we know anybody? Do we know anyone that knows Angelina Jolie? And I'm thinking, yes, I do. <laughs> because I used to work in Hollywood in film and television. And I had um, a, great, a great friend who was a cinematographer on Monsters Ball that, well, knew Angelina because of Billy Bob Thornton. So I reached out to him and through his wife, who's a Caroline Schaefer, who is a, a costume designer, she had worked with Angelina and Julie. So she put us in touch and I, with her assistant. And so I was speaking or communicating with her assistant and she said, Angelina is very interested. I mean, she had just been through a high-end village. Right. Uh, that with the family, actually the, the woman and the daughter that Mu bought one of the coins from in the film. And I think she had a very strong, you know, reaction, you know, visceral reaction to, to being there. So probably she understood a little bit what we were trying to do uh, and she was interested to speak about it. Um, and at the time, like I said, we were coming up at, up at the end of our time there and Angelina um, offered to be the voice in the film, in the documentary, do, wow. do the voice. And um, this is the thing that we were, Paco and I are kind of maybe not the norm <laughs> of documentary filmmakers. And when we were so involved in already in Cayenne culture, and we thought we knew from the beginning, we want, we want Moo to tell her story. We want them to tell their story. We want to preserve the language. We don't want to have a, a voiceover talking about, you know, this kind of idea of this culture. And so I found myself letting you know, her know, thank you, but actually <laughs> um, we don't need a voiceover. We are actually looking for financial support uh, so we can maybe stay and see Mu off to when she's resettled. And then um, that that didn't work out at that moment. Um, also, I think I saw in the headlines that they, she might've had some tussle with Brad. <laughs> So we just actually, we let it go and we just came back to um, Europe where we were based in Spain. And we weren't there for when Mu left. You know, we did have somebody who we uh, had worked with, one of the translators. He did film her getting in the truck and leaving. Um, but you know, that's also a part of our choice in this, in the way we set up this film is like, we know we're not gonna be with her all the time. Over the expanse of time as well, so we had to be only a couple of years, but then, yeah, you know what? We found our way to her in Kentucky. Okay, now it's going to cover this expanse of a few years. And then for a lot of other reasons, we weren't able to finish at that time. And then we were fortunate that she called us and she came back to Thailand. So we were actually along the way, as much as we were wanting to finish the film, I feel the time that we let it breathe and let Mu live out her life and become aware of these things that she was experiencing in, in her new environment, in her new world. It gave us all the time to formulate the film as it is today. Um, not to say that, you know, everybody has the patience for that, but it was something that we, we actually feel uh, quite fortunate it, it, it worked out. And I can't imagine a film without that space and without going back and how you ended it. I don't want to, I, I don't want to, you know, um, tell too much about the ending in case there might be people watching who haven't seen it, but it's a good ending, you know, but stylistically, I think that it would have been a completely different movie if it was voiced by Angelina Jolie, yeah. you know, um, <laughs> and the fact that uh, Mu, like that would have erased part of Mu and her culture from this film. And you really honored Mu and her story by making that difficult choice, right? I mean, like, hey, Angelina Jolie, maybe you could have gotten into 
certain film festivals or gotten certain distribution, but um, you have really good instincts. Uh, you and Paco both have very good instincts. So thank you so much for this. Um, as we wrap up, I have a few last questions. Um, Moo, how is your son today? You said you guys are best friends. <laughs> um, um, but you guys I, are like now living in a town called Davis, Iowa with 200 people. You are the <laughs> only Asian Americans living yeah. in the town, right? Yeah. Uh, how how is life for you? Well, life is great. I heard a lot of people say, you know, a uh, teenager is hard, hard to take care of teenager. But me and John, we, we always go to be friends, you know, first day into today, into probably into I die. And he he's amazing. I can't complain. I, I'm... I'm the most lucky mother. I, mother, I can't complain. That is nothing. Amazing. Nothing out that I will ask more than this. Mm -hmm. did, has he watched the movie? Yeah, he did. He did. And and what does he think about the movie? Because well, he's he, looking at himself he, and he doesn't remember himself as a movie, right? He don't remember, but he do tell me and say that, Ma, I know you are a strong mother, but I didn't know much you go through a lot of things he do do on that yeah and that's that's part of the the title here the vanishing world you know as as the cayenne long neck people become you know um there you know more people are moving out of the village mm -hmm. you know into different places in the world fewer and fewer how do we, you know, keep that story alive? And it's through films like this, Jessica, and you captured the vanishing world. Mm -hmm. So this film is a live archive mm -hmm. of Wu and her and her culture. Did you think about that intentionally as you were making this movie? Oh, absolutely. We knew that um, with the growing diaspora, that would be a difficult way. It would be difficult to manage to keep what they had at that moment. Right. Mm -hmm. And so now, of course, we do see now there are Kayan people, like I said, in, also in Finland, New Zealand. But I have to say, I, I do feel like with Mu and the way that she's become very respectful and proud of her culture, in some ways, I feel that it is, uh, it's still going to have a life. It's going to she's breathing life into her Kayan culture in America. <laughs> And so it is a different form for sure. Uh, but yeah, this, this was a moment in time that we did feel like it's all it's all gonna go, you know. Uh, there were younger generation that were taking off their coils in, in their coil in protest in a way, you know, there was people rebelling from that and then people wanting to move on to the next, you know, other world. Um, so you just didn't know at that time, how's it going to be for everyone? And in the new form it's in, in Thailand, it is, it's difficult, you know, I mean, I know that people are managing, people who are still in touch with their, are thriving in their way, uh, having, growing their families there, you know, so they're finding the way, but I really, again, think that, um, not to lay it all on Moo, <laughs> but Moo really is going to play an integral part to bring, you know, to keep this culture alive. Yeah, yeah. And as you were talking about taking off the coils too, yet again, another connection to the idea of freedom as she took her coils off so that she can freely move in between refugee camps, you know? Mm -hmm. So that um, uh, that is a, a great symbol. Um, so as we wrap up, I wanted to ask the both of you, has and how has this movie changed your life? And what have you gained as a result of this film? So we'll start with you, Jessica. I honestly really, I mean, clearly it's, it was quite a, a journey and a challenge and very difficult at times, but being able to actually have it see it through, uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's changed my life in many ways just for that kind of trajectory and to know what it actually took to go through that. Obviously all the reconnections with Mu, wherever she was, was quite the journey. We were on like, you know, a side journey with her. So that's always, it's also been 
part of our journey, how on myself. But I think most of all I've gained is Mu. I, I feel like, you know, just having Mu in our life, in my life, I mean, she is the, the most kind of inspirational, you know, motivational woman that I am so happy to share this life with because our conversations, you know, really are empower me. Uh, when I hear what, where she's at, as things progress, as she finds her value as a woman, um, the strength in her own, you know, possibilities, all of those moments that she shares that with me really propel myself in my own life uh, into where I am. And and so I, I, I feel like, yeah, the most huge blessing in all this was having Moo in my life, <laughs> honestly. And Moo, how has this film changed your life or impacted your life? Was, it's a lot. Um, well, first of all, um, I like I talked to Jessica before, you know, I, my lies, I don't know that I was a value before. And mm -hmm. as you can see, when I was in Thailand and I was single mom and just try to fight every day from my, my freedoms. And when I came here and I'm every day, I start to learn in and new life, new stuff that I can do. And then I have this movie is done. And then I went back to look at the movie picture, like some of the picture I almost forgot. <laughs> And the big end thing I gain is, you know, one day if I, I'm not around or alive anymore, I'm going to have my son and my son's going to show to his kid or my grandkid, you know, I hope one day, right? And to say, hey, you know, your mom, my mom's brought me here and she's strong mother, you know, I just want to tell my kid that and that I'm um, trying my best. And I think this is what the most thing that I gained mm -hmm. from memory. Mm -hmm. Well, that's beautiful, Mu. I appreciate you. The, um, and yes, this film, I think film in general is such a powerful medium to help people feel valued, as you said, seen and heard. And that's what we all want in life, right? That's part of humanity. So Jessica and Mu, thank you so much for bringing us this humanity and sharing this story. I, I, as a person have grown so much, not just in my knowledge and understanding of, of Kayan and the Kareni people, but understanding that there are so many universal, there, there's so many connections, right? Even though we're so different, we're, we're so similar in what we want out of life. Um, real quick, Jessica and Mu, what are you working on now that people can look forward to and how can they connect with you? Jessica, let's start with you. Mm -hmm. Well, actually Paco and I are back in Spain. Well, at the moment I'm in California, but we are um, set, setting up back in Spain and we are working on a documentary. Um, it's on our uh, website, dosvelas.pictures. And it's all, you know, it's, it's human stories that are, are really, you show, the, show our resilience uh, and really the power of turning adversity into poetry. Looking forward to that. So it's Dos Velas, it's D-O-S-V-E-L-A-S pictures.com. Pictures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh, dot pictures. Dot com. Yeah, Dos Velas dot pictures. Got it, okay, so we'll make sure that, that people yeah, check that out. And then Moo, what are you working on these days? <laughs> well, you won't believe this. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm, um, I found uh, the company is 2017. And I'm a foundation found a company called Songbirds International LLC. On that time, I, I'm the only ones who work in front of the company. And now I have a um, contractor is almost 16 people work under the Sombers 
Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And we provide uh, interpreters, translations, and also certified nurse into uh, to the clinic and some play like a uh, production company, like um, meat company. That's amazing. Well, congratulations. And I understand that you all have bigger plans on what to do with your farm. Yeah, that is my next dream. <laughs> and I, what is that? I want what to tell us your dream. <laughs> yeah. I can give you a little bit idea. My biggest dream is right now I own the 48 acre. And on that acre, I want to have um uh, to have an animal and I also want to have a valet. On that valet, I want to have um a small small house and with a different cultures and like music and dancing and foods. I just want to bring back my own memory of what I used to grow up in the United States. Oh, so like recreating a small, like a, a mini Cayenne village for yourself yeah. on your farm. That yeah. is so beautiful. So that means anybody who's watching, when you're ready for that, we all have to take a road trip to Davis City, Iowa to come visit yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. In a small <laughs> town. And the biggest thing, uh, this is what my dream too. Um, and Davis City is a very small town. And this is what I want to, small town to the big town. I want to uh, make a big town in Davis City. <laughs> I have no doubt if that is your dream that you will make it happen. If there's anyone that I know, Moo, you can do it. So um, Jessica and Moo, thank you so much for your time. And thank you so much for letting us dive back into this film and your experiences. We want to thank our audience and we hope you enjoyed this discussion. If you enjoyed this film, please share it with your friends. Be sure to check out our two other films in the series, Sisters Rising and The Archivettes. You can find more information at the Women's Museum of California website. Again, Jessica and Mu, thank you so much and be well. Thank you, Leanne. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much.